I am excited to be interviewing Christine Sleeter. She's an outstanding multicultural scholar, world renowned, and without further ado, I'm going to ask for Christine to focus on the past, present, and future of multicultural education. Um, I always trace the roots of multicultural education as it, we know it today to the civil rights movement of the 1960s, although it, it has roots that go back much further yes. than that, in, in particularly in, in struggles around race. But during the 1960s, as African Americans began to um, uh, very seriously push against the um, Jim Crow, um, and then with Brown versus the Board of Education, the decision that uh, at the federal level dismantled Jim Crow, more or less, it's still around, but more <laughs> yeah. or less, yeah. But that gave impetus for the organizing, the community-based organizing and education organizing that came about during the 1960s. And multicultural education grew out of that. And the reason why I think it's important to remember those roots is that in many, many schools, multicultural education now seems to mean um, learning about other cultures by way of foods and festivals mm -hmm. and holidays. Yes. And when people don't know the history of it, um, they really don't know what it's about. And so I'll sometimes hear people today talking about multicultural education is that that was something kind of passe. I remember mm -hmm. um, an administrator once saying to me, well, I can see where multicultural education could be useful for creating a warm classroom environment, but what does this have to do oh with teaching? Goodness. And it was not understanding what it is and the mm -hmm. kinds of transformations of, of classrooms, of schools, and of the broader society that multicultural education really is about. Mm -hmm. So when I think of multicultural education moving on into the future, you know, I was um, thinking about this actually in the wake of the last election, mm -hmm. just, you know, mm -hmm. less than a month ago. Yes. ago. And it's been real interesting to me to watch um, the extent to which the U.S., and particularly white America, is having a hard time getting its head around the fact that we are a very diverse country and we are a country in which exclusion and oppression is a very, very, very concrete reality in the lives of a lot of people. Um, and that I believe that a diverse country can work, but I also believe that we have a long, long way to go to get there. And I see multicultural education as we move into the future as continuing to stay grounded in the everyday realities of people, particularly around issues of, of justice and injustice, inclusion, um, uh, sustainability. I, I think, for instance, of instead of measuring the United States against our GDP, what if we measured it against the well-being of our citizens? And that, to me, that's what multicultural education needs to be about. What it was about in the 1960s, and as the issues change, but continuing that on. Um, maybe one of the changes over time is that as we more deliberately include issues of, of gender, issues of sexual orientation, issues of disability, in addition to the issues of race, language, culture, and class, so that we're talking maybe more fully yes. about justice for all of us. Mm -hmm. In um, a lot of your work these days, you've really focused on accountability. How does accountability sort of take its place as relates to the things that you're talking about now? That's an interesting question because to me really accountability really means who are we accountable to. The, um, the standards movement, which has turned into really a test-driven movement, um, kind of steered largely by big um, corporations, um, publication companies, but also kind of corporations writ large, has 
um, turned into a movement of making schools, trying to make schools accountable, I think to those at the top of the heap, when what schools really, I think schools really need to be accountable and teachers accountable to the communities that they serve. Mm -hmm. I do think that I'm, I'm not like completely against testing because I think test data are, is very useful mm -hmm. and that communities and parents need to know how well kids are serving their students um, as measured by some of the kinds of, of measures that people across the country can be held, you know, held to. Mm -hmm. um, but the question of who we're accountable to is a question that really needs to be addressed a lot more. Yeah, um, and let's put that in a more global perspective. Uh, you know, multicultural education um, has really influenced the world now for the 21st century. And so, you know, you know as well as I do, when we're in various countries, oftentimes we're, we're serving in capacities of um, consultants to mm -hmm. work in areas of professional development for educators, mm -hmm. um, working at curriculum development and those kinds of things. And so that's a, that's a big question as well, accountability. Um, and so in the global sense, how do we as multicultural educators um, give that feel for or that international view of things. How do we begin to talk about accountability when we're talking about community? And, and um, Chris Noss said it very well as we talked about moving into the future and really having to look at, um, not from our lens, but from the community lens, and mm -hmm. how do we begin to make change? And that's where the accountability is going to lie. But how do we put all of that together when we're trying to really say, we're living in a very on a very small planet. Mm -hmm. How can we work together as it relates to um, really seeing multicultural education progress into this global multicultural education mm -hmm. sphere and be accountable for all of its global citizens? Mm -hmm. A complexity that I see is trying to figure out um, connections between global dialogue and global mm -hmm. solidarity mm -hmm. on the one hand mm -hmm. and and responsiveness to particular communities and their own local cultures and histories mm -hmm. on the other hand mm -hmm. there's there's a possibility that multicultural education can become a kind of a colonizing discourse mm -hmm. where it comes, if it comes like out of one place and then uh, th there's a lot that from the U.S. Mm -hmm. that becomes That's very right. colonizing. Mm -hmm. right. And I, when, when I'm traveling outside of the U.S. as a consultant, mm -hmm. I try to be really mindful of the fact that it's, it's, it's so much a part of how the U.S does things globally, mm -hmm. that we simply take and transport our ways of doing yes. things to mm -hmm. other places around the world. Mm -hmm. um, and an example, and I'm actually going to be kind of, I think, weaving this back into your question. Mm -hmm. um, about a week and a half ago, I was in Taiwan. Mm -hmm. And we were, one of the things that I was, my hostess and I were talking about was the exportation of U.S. food mm -hmm. and how the Taiwanese kids are starting to get fat because they're eating the kind of things that come, that's yes. sort of a part of the colonization. Right. And when I get asked to talk about multicultural education, I can talk about, you know, here's how we think about it in the U.S. Mm -hmm. And here are maybe some tools that you might want to use. But what I don't, I, I, I like dialogue, yeah, yeah, yeah. but I don't want to say, mm -hmm. here's the formula, pick it Absolutely. up and use it. Mm -hmm. um, I was in a, um, a, spent part of a day in a um, um, aboriginal school in Taiwan. I don't know if you know very much mm -hmm. about the indigenous sure. peoples sure. of Taiwan. Sure. Okay. And a question that they were having was, how do we make the um, curriculum more indigenous centric and I'm sitting there thinking this is really interesting because here I am from the US I don't speak Chinese or Taiwanese or the local indigenous language and I can't really like what do I have to say to but the conversation that we got into was one about how do we organize teaching and learning so that the teachers and the students together are learning from the community and that was 
a way of thinking about the question that they actually hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. And I guess they got real excited. Yeah. Um, and um, my host, my hostess has been kind of following me up on where that conversation is going. But I think, it, it's, to me, it sort of gets back to at the local community state and national levels, people really need to grapple with the realities that face them as it relates to power, um, inclusion, or exclusion, or wh whatever those realities are in ways that locally make sense. Mm -hmm. Sometimes through cross-national dialogues, yes. we can, we can you know, put a lens on something right. where uh, and it, it goes both ways, mm -hmm. of where we're, oh, geez, I hadn't thought about that mm -hmm. way before. Mm -hmm. And I see that as constructive. Mm -hmm. But I worry if, if I feel like there's too much of, of a kind of a U.S. colonizing discourse. Mm -hmm.